you're going to learn a lot about the vision that we hold for Central Park, the science behind that vision. So this night, would not, we would not have Dr. Weston tonight if it weren't for a teacher in this room that took the time to write a grant. So I just want to acknowledge Linda Berger from the Pacific. So last time Linda wrote, we were talking about, our whole staff were talking about, we, we need to provide a series of um, parent education. And we talked about Dr. Weston, and honestly, I thought, how could we ever get Dr. Weston here? Oh my goodness. So she wrote a grant. And it's because of you, the community, that funded that grant, and some outside folks that funded the grant that we were able to have him here. So I want to just applaud you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to talk about all these credentials. I'll let him talk about that. But Dr. Weston, we are just so happy to have you here tonight. So thank you. And thank you to all the parents that were able to come out. Very nice introduction. What I'd like to do this evening is to share with you some of the research behind what STEM is and why STEM works and why it should be expanded to the notion of what we call STEAM or STREAM. And I'll explain to you what those notions happen to be. Uh, I mentioned earlier to Linda and Micah that I'm on the advisory board for the Korean Institute of Brain Science in South Korea where we produce some of the highest scores in the world for math and science. And it's primarily because we've collapsed all of the disciplines and we teach by project. We teach in the same manner that you do as adults when you work in industry. So rather than speaking to the issue of one discipline at a time, we find that that's the hardest way for children to remember. And this is why when they come home in the evening, you ask them, what did you learn today? They say, nothing. <laughs> and it's because when everything that they're learning, each hour is completely discontinuous with what they learned the previous hour, it's hard to make connections. And that's the whole purpose of having a brain, is to make connections. And if you can't connect what you're learning, it's very difficult to what? To learn. And so we've worked on softening the softening the borders between the disciplines in such a manner that all kids can learn in ways that are natural for us to learn and process information. But part of this, is there a way to at least dim the lights, Micah, Linda, is there a way to dim the lights in the very front at least? At least temporarily? Okay. That's more than the front. <laughs> See, she's an overachiever. <laughs> but one of the things we say we need to do is to abandon our... Sorry, I think they're a little tricky. <laughs> Just in time. Okay. One, of the things, one of the things we say we must do is to find ways to abandon some of our cognitive frames. Alvin Toffler said, the illiterates of the future are not those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And we're in the process of relearning much of what we've learned from the colleges of education on how is it that children learn. And here's a, here's a problem. And first, turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself if you don't know your neighbor. And now bring them down across the shoulder of the person seated next to you. And now, as you look around the room, you notice everyone is smiling. And that is because touch turns on the brain. We do our best learning when we have opportunities to work with objects, work with other people, where we have opportunities to touch. And that's because the same tissue mass that becomes a brain eventually it splits through the early stages of neurogenesis, and the other half becomes, guess what? 
your skin. Your skin is literally the other half of your brain, and that's why hands-on learning is so incredibly powerful. And that's why the STEM and STEAM models work so incredibly well, because they cater to the natural inclinations of how the brain processes information. Now here's a problem. Gary is lying dead on the floor, but around him is a puddle of water and some shards of broken glass, and we're trying to figure out what are the circumstances surrounding his death. And so we envision chalk lines around the blood spattered body where it was and caution tape. And the scene is located in a disreputable part of town. But who could have broken the glass? How and why? And what could the puddle of water mean? Turn to your neighbor who you just met and see if the two of you can figure out what happened to Gary. 30 seconds, what happened to Gary? How would you explain these shards of glass and this puddle of water? It's by means of new information that we change our cognitive frames. But learning, education, discovery, invention are all about what? Changing those frames and finding new ways to think. What we're doing today is preparing youngsters for a world and, a, and future occupations that have yet to be created, that we haven't envisioned nor encountered yet, and they demand skill sets that have not even merged together yet. Which tells us that we can no longer teach disciplines, we can no longer teach facts. Most of us grew up doing what? Memorizing facts. Long lists of facts and information. But the facts continue to change. Dr. James Dockerberry said that facts and information will change every 73 days by the year 2025 which means we can no longer memorize information. At one time we said the noble gas is argon, argon krypton, and neon could not form compounds, and then a 31-year-old chemist, Neil Bartlett, didn't realize this, formed compounds, which changed the content of our chemistry text. We're constantly, constantly making new discoveries, particularly in the context of science, which means we can no longer teach the facts. And think about this, today's kindergartners, kids who are starting school this fall, will retire in the year 2077. <laughs> and so we ask, what are the kinds of things that we must prepare them for between 2017 and 27, 2077? And what are the kinds of foundations that we have to help establish for them in a world that's going to be completely unknown? Which means we can teach them not subjects, not content, but teach them how to think. And that's the whole purpose of school, is to teach students how to think. And we ask, what year are your students being prepared for? With the traditional models, most of our students are actually being prepared for today's world. 
with the STEAM and STEM models and STREAM models. We're seeing kids who are preparing for the future because the focus is on teaching students how to think. So what we're going to talk about tonight are what we call the best practices for teaching and learning. And right now it looks like the STEM, STEAM and STREAM models are most important. And this is based on, please jot this down, what we now call interdisciplinarity. And that is not teaching by disciplines, but teaching the same manner in which most of us as adults solve problems. We don't do math in one hour, do we? We don't do reading for one hour. We don't look at social studies and social interactions with our colleagues one hour a day. We do it constantly, don't we? We merge it and we constantly use those skills and competencies to solve problems and to work effectively in the real world. Second, why is the STEM STEAM model so important? That's important because that's how the world truly works. And third, how does the brain work? I'm actually a cognitive neuroscientist. My work is in how the brain learns, how children learn. And what we find is that there are some means by which children learn better than others. And one of them happens to be hands-on learning, the other happens to be lots of opportunities to talk and write, lots of opportunities to express and produce knowledge. And it's the talking that becomes very important, and we seldom talk about the importance of children talking. Because talking, I have to stay away from, we'll get that feedback, I'll stay over here. I'll honor the lines here. <laughs> What we find, and many of you probably have seen the Baby Einstein products. Yeah, there are about six of us who worked for four years to get Baby Einstein products taken off the market. What we found is that Baby Einstein products made no contribution to cognitive growth and development whatsoever, and children who spent a lot of time with the product were actually language delayed. The product actually hurt children, not helped. Okay? There are some ways by which children learn best, and I'll talk about those tonight. So we're gonna have some opportunities to work with the people seated next to us. Hopefully you're seated next to someone you like. <laughs> Don't look around, that's rude, I see some of you. <laughs> but think about the question, how did you learn best in school? Okay. By show of hands, how many of you enjoyed science when you were a kid? Okay. How many of you liked biology the best? How about physics? How about chemistry? Astronomy? Or some other subject? Yeah. Now, take a moment. Take a, take a moment and share with your neighbor 15 seconds what was it that you liked about that class and what made it memorable? What did you like and what made it memorable? Turn to your neighbor. that you remembered? And, yes? The teacher. The teacher. Okay. Makes a difference. What else? Hands-on. Hands-on learning. Lab work. Lab work, which is hands-on learning. Most of you probably shared with your neighbor something you did, not something you heard. I'm from higher education, and we prepare lectures for our students. We sometimes stay up till 1.30 in the morning preparing what we think is the best lecture in the world. Students don't remember our lectures. Students remember what they did in class. The STEM model, the STEAM model, is about learning by doing. It's what we call learning the practices of science and engineering. 
It's the practices, very much like in medicine, it's the practices that we're after, not the information. How is it that you put the information to good use? That's when that information has value. Okay. Most of you remember biology, dissecting your first frog. Oh, yes. And so for some of you, that was your last frog. <laughs> but you remembered doing. Okay. And it's the doing that has impact. What we find is that only 13% of learners are actually auditory learners which means we're typically not meeting the needs of 87% of our students 100% of the time. But all kids learn best by doing. We have evolved to have what we call doer brains. Our brains were designed to do, and that's how we learn. But we don't learn by lecture. And I learned that lesson the hard way. Okay? But research tells us how students learn best. And this is from the K-12 science education framework. And some of you have probably seen your kids bring home information in books on the Common Core English Language Arts, Common Core Mathematics. Now we are into the STEM, STEAM, and STREAM models. But all of them were influenced by cognitive scientists. Cognitive scientists were asked to come in and share with the developers of curriculum not what content children should learn, but instead, how children learn, which is far more important. If you don't understand how children learn, the content doesn't really matter, does it? Because the content will be elusive if it's not addressing how children learn instead. What we find is that children learn best through real-world first-hand experiences, not through memorization. They learn by doing. And here's why. How many of you have been pregnant before? Women only, women only. <laughs> Something very important happens during the early stages of neurogenesis, and that's brain development. And that is that the same tissue mass that becomes the brain, it splits, and the other half becomes the skin. But many of you also remember that pregnant women are also very grumpy. <laughs> and they're very grumpy because they're very nauseous on a regular basis. And they're nauseous because brain cells are being produced in utero at the amazing rate of 250,000 every single minute. To make certain that nothing interferes with that delicate brain building process, it's your job as hostess to expel any possible toxins that you may have ingested. And that's how you deliver a healthy baby nine months later. But without that process, this is what will contribute to deformities. Okay? So all children learn best through first-hand experiences. Those of you who have taught us may have noticed that when kids learn how to crawl, what do they do? They set out on an exploration of the world, don't they? And they use the senses. If something catches their eye, the visual sense, they crawl over to it, and then they do what? They give it the touch test. And if it looks good and feels good, it gets the what? The taste test. <laughs> but they use the senses. And we've been able to identify over 22 senses, not five. And all of them converge to help us understand the world as we experience it. Next, understanding builds over time. And we typically will deliver a lecture, and students will do this, listening to our lecture, and all we know is that their neck muscles are still operative because that doesn't mean they've encoded the information for the purpose of reproduction or application. Okay? We want students to have long extended periods where they experience a concept where we're not hopping from one concept to the other, and as soon as they're beginning to get comfortable with one, we're on to what? A new concept. Okay. Next, the whole purpose of having a brain is to make sense of incoming information. Where this self-produced or experience, we're constantly trying to make sense of any information coming into the brain. And last and most important, our new effort is focused on science and engineering practices, where we focus on the thinking, knowing, and doing, or the applications. How is it that scientists produce knowledge in their field? What is it that engineers should know to apply engineering concepts to produce new artifacts, new inventions? What is it that they need to know? All engineers spend the National Research Council said, engineers spend 
50 to 80 percent of their time engaged in what we call language arts, reading, writing, and doing research. That's what? The application of language arts in ways that make sense. Unfortunately, we teach these concepts in isolation and can struggle when it comes time to apply them into another discipline. We say, no, teach the concepts within the discipline. That's how children learn best. Okay. The STEM stream and problem-based learning model is how students learn best. And what we find from research, Piaget said, the real cause of failure in formal education is essentially the fact that one begins with language, that is lecture, instead of beginning with real and material action. Here's how the brain actually works. When we have first-hand, real-world, concrete experiences where we're touching artifacts in the environment, we can now create pictures in the mind's eye of that experience, can't we? And then later, we can now add the word to which this should be most often associated. But this is a symbolic, abstract level of thinking. And it's grounded in being able to picture in the mind's eye the concrete object itself. Oftentimes, we start from here and we go that direction, don't we? And this is why kids struggle or fail. And sometimes we start here and we don't go any further. And if, pictures, if students have trouble picturing the concept in the mind's eye, they'll never be able to move forward with reading comprehension. And this is why we say art is an essential part of that STEAM and thinking model. So we ask the question, what is STEM and what is STEAM? Okay. I've written a number of articles for journals on the concept of STEM, STEAM, and STREAM. Uh, the most recent was for the Middle Eastern Journal. Uh, okay. But science, we say, seeks to understand the natural world around us. Science is by far the most exciting discipline for kids until they what? Go to school. And when they go to school, the manner in which we sometimes have taught science, we've encouraged them to decide, I don't like science. And that's because they do what? They read about science instead of doing science. We say science should be a verb, not a noun. Okay. Technology. Technology is actually all of the artifacts and devices that we use to produce thinking. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that technology and computers are synonymous. Technology is any tool that we use to produce knowledge, including computers, but not by way of computers. Computers are simply one artifact by which we can produce knowledge, and it goes along with all of the others. Engineering. Engineering is the process of actually creating strategies and procedures and objects that help us understand the world, tools that we use to find solutions to problems that we experience in the world. Some of you may remember the TV show Late Night with David Letterman, where he had the top 10 lists. Here are the top 10 fears in the United States. Number 10 is dogs, number 9 is loneliness, flying, death, sickness, deep water, drowning, financial problems, insects and bugs, heights. But guess what number 1 is? Speaking in front of groups. And you notice people would rather die than speak in front of groups. But on this list should also be technology and engineering. Okay. And most teachers are afraid of engineering, most parents are afraid of engineering, but engineering is one of the most exciting ways in which we can teach all of the disciplines. Okay. What we find is that only 1% of K-2 K teachers and 2% of grade 3 through 5 teachers have had even a seminar, let alone a full class, on engineering, which is why many teachers are adverse to teaching engineering. But what we find, and please jot this down if you're a parent, and that is that all engineering begins with a design. And if it begins with a design, that design is a what? A drawing. And if you can teach art, you're well on your way to teaching engineering. Because 
art is the first important step in engineering. And this is why we call it design and engineering, not just engineering, but design and engineering. It always begins with a design or a drawing. Mathematics. Math mathematics is about patterns and relationships. Some of you, if you're between about 35 and 50, you probably grew up on a math program called the Addison Wesley Mathematics, which was developed at Stanford. I was the developer of that program. It was the most widely used and best selling math program in the country. And it was because we brought in manipulatives to help kids understand math. It wasn't just workbooks, it wasn't a textbook. It was learning math by manipulating objects and beginning to get a feel for what three plus two actually is when you feel it and see it. And then you can transfer that easily to the textbook. And that way every kid had a chance to be very successful in math. But it was about developing an understanding of the patterns and relationships. And the numbers reflected those patterns and relationships. But math is not about the numbers themselves. It's about the patterns and the relationships. Many of you recall memorizing algorithms like this one. Okay? Best way to teach math is to take 10 and look at all the ways and teach children all the ways you can make 10. When students are thinking about how is it that you construct 10, we're now learning how to construct knowledge. And that's how they can remember and apply it to almost any situation. If they've gone through the construction process themselves. A moment ago we talked about understanding building, building over time. Before 1956, we had what was called information science, and that was where science was delivered via textbook. And those of you who remember Dick and Jane textbooks, our science book was almost identical to our Dick and Jane reader. We'd read a chapter, at the end we'd answer questions, but we never touched any object that helped produce knowledge within the discipline of science. In 1996, with the National Science Education Standards, we moved towards what was called inquiry, where we had students answer lots of questions about science. And this is the first time science became interesting for most youngsters. In 2012, we moved into what we now call investigations. And that's where students have opportunities to investigate concepts, talk about the concepts, and have an opportunity to delve into what makes that principle so, where they find out the why, under what conditions, and begin asking one of the most important questions in science, and that is, what if? What if I change X? How would that affect the outcome? That's when students are now thinking, and thinking in a creative vein. We moved from instructivism, which was just teaching and talking to children, to constructionism, which was the notion of Piaget, and we're now into what's called constructionism, where we actually construct artifacts, where students are now building objects to understand the principles within a discipline. And we are now doing what we call building by means of learning progressions. And at the end of your row, you'll see a red disc and now create a little car. That can roll down a ramp. And we can continue to refine this design until we have the optimal design to see if we can get this car to roll down the ramp and reach 100 centimeters at the end. Well, we asked students to do a couple of things before that. We asked, well, if we have two wheels together that we can create a wheel bearing system. We solved that with, with one red disc, we could get the system to spin. But we asked the question, well, what if we added more weight? Will this spin faster, slower, more steady, less steady? We say more weight should be a problem, shouldn't it? Make sense? And we'll... 
gentleman, your name is? Donna Shaker. If you can spin this on the floor right here where we can see. Okay. Suddenly, we see more weight actually makes it a more what? More stable system. We typically say more weight is going to make it more difficult to spread. It actually turns out to be better. And what we find is that the ideal system is one like this that begins to approach a conical shape, a cone shape. The more it approximates a cone shape, the more stable the system will be. We ask students to build a cart. We ask them, well, this cart has some design flaws that could be improved. And so we ask students first to engineer a cart. And we say, well, what if we could... And these are some of the, as you can tell, done by students. And this is when students are given the freedom to be creative. Okay. This cart is designed where all students make the same cart, and they have to be similar if we're going to compare them as they go down the ramp. But then we say, given the constraints of these materials, can you design a new cart? And this is what we call re-engineering. Design a new cart. Engineering a cart, we have students identify how far their cart went, record their data, typically three or four trials, and we look for the averages. We have them enter their data and construct a data table. Data should tell a story, shouldn't they? And if you look at these data, they tell a story about the starting position, whether it's at six, 12, 24, or 48 centimeters from the bottom. And we get very consistent data, don't we? And we can have students write about what they learned based on the data and the experience. This is one of the best ways to teach children how to write. Typically, when we give students writing assignments, the first thing we hear them do is groan. But when students have an opportunity to write about their own experience, they have no trouble writing at all. We ask students to re-engineer their cart, design a slightly different cart, and this is, and please jot this down if you're a parent, it's what we call the adjacent possible. And that is looking at where we are, and what is adjacent that's possible because it's very similar. It's called the adjacent possible. How do we brainstorm to make a gradual and tiny change to produce a different outcome? I just got back from Dubai where we had the first international STEM conference, so I gave the keynote and did two follow-up workshops. And these are some of the carts that teachers from around the world built. And some of them are quite ingenious. But all of them exhibited the exact same principles of physics, but their outcomes are slightly different because their designs were also slightly different. One gentleman actually could get a bottle of water to travel along with his cart. Some decided to get very cute with their carts. And some were actually lovely. But what we want teachers to do, and what we want kids to do, is learn to first invent, innovate, improvise, and improve. And most of you may recall back in the 1980s, almost every commercial you saw on television, when they introduced their product, they said, this is new and improved. And the improvement was what? Your adjacent possible. Taking the existing product, how is it that we make it slightly better and the kind that would be more appealing to a consumer? We have students measure the distance, record their data, 
re-engineered their cart, and now the re-engineering, we're looking for a cart that goes at least 25 centimeters first, further than their first cart, which means they have to redesign a cart in a similar manner. Here's another cart that students designed. This was a cart, I'll pass this around. This is... <laughs> this is a cart that also had an opportunity to recycle and repurpose a discardable. But now, I'll let you pass it around, please. And let me go the long way. <laughs> we had students build carts out of balsa wood. This one, if you touch the lights, this one actually has headlights that will light up. Now deploying something from magnetism and electricity. Okay. This one actually has a little motor and it will travel very slowly, but it does travel. This is a pilotless car. You have fingernails? But it's adjacent possible that we're first after. Then we teach children to use other means by which they can produce a cart using other products. And then build a cart with a remote control. But it all began with what? It all began with nothing more than a spin top. When students can begin looking at a spin top and seeing a car in that, that's when we know they're beginning to master the concepts of engineering. The way the brain works is we have visual areas, we have association areas that actually make connections for us, we have the motor cortex, this is the part of the brain that helps us with movement, Broca's area for speech, for listening, the emotional areas, we have multiple areas of the brain, all of which participate in the process of learning. What we find is that it typically takes six exposures for information to permanently lodge in the brain. Which means the idea of a lecture, one singular experience, that's why kids struggle. When they have multiple opportunities to talk with their colleagues, to read a bot, hear a bot, build, move, that's how kids learn. And that's what sticks into the brain permanently, which is why many of you remember what you did in school, not what you heard. Don't you want the same for your kids? You want school to be a memorable experience. And that means we have to do the kinds of things we just saw a moment ago. What we know is that students will pledge their attention to anything that stimulates them, right? Kids look for stimulation. We all look for stimulation. And this is once again based on looking at all of the parts of the brain and how each processes information differently. Each has a different responsibility, but it all comes together for a singular experience. And the more areas that are affected in the brain for that singular experience, the more multiple access routes you have back to that information that helps you understand it, remember it, and then transfer that information to new experiences. Much of this is the foundation of what you're going to hear a lot about this year and next, and that's the next generation science standards. These are the new science standards for the state of California. They're national standards, but we have a special set of standards for California. And these are based on what we call the core ideas, and the core ideas are simply what scientists know. And the practices are what scientists do in order to produce knowledge. And the cross-cutting concepts are what do we do, how is it that we think, how do we organize information to make sense. And what we know, what we do, and how we think is basically everything that you'll need to know as a parent to help your students succeed with the new next generation science standards. 
but it's the practices that we're after. Now, what's about to happen in this picture? It looks like this shrimp is about to meet a grizzly in, but he's actually cleaning the teeth of the lizard fish. He's cleaning those teeth. This is what's called a symbiotic relationship, where both survive because they cooperate to support one another. We say the same thing is true about our curriculum. We use reading in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, don't we? We use art in all of them. We use art in reading. All of these should come together to converge into a singular experience for learning. And the more we do so, the easier it is for students to learn and to remember. We now have the next generation science standards. We have standards for mathematics, standards for English language arts. Dr. Bob Marzano said it would take approximately 26 years to teach all of the new standards one at a time, which is what most schools are trying to do. 26 years, that means your kids will begin graduating high school at age 31. That's not the goal. The goal is to get students how to think. And so we're looking at all the ways in which we can find the overlap, not points of intersection, but points of overlap, where multiple concepts and multiple disciplines can be taught simultaneously. If you look at some of the concepts we teach in reading, mathematics, and science, if you look horizontally, we're actually teaching the same concept, but the language changes as we move from discipline to discipline, don't, does it? If the concept is changing only by name as we move from one discipline to the next, we're teaching the exact same concept, which means we can teach them simultaneously and describe how they're treated differently within each discipline, but that the concept is essentially the same. Our goal is to move away from the idea of knowledge in one discipline or application within one discipline, but now looking at application across disciplines, disciplines, the application into the predictable situations, but most important, applications in the real world, unpredictable situations. Because the problems that our kids are going to be called on to solve in the future are problems that don't exist yet. But the strategies for solving them do. And the more we can teach them all the ways in which they can solve problems, the better off they're going to be as adults, and, that's, and the greatest likelihood they're going to be creative individuals. If you think about Silicon Valley, we say a Silicon Valley capitalist firm is asking you to write a great idea to sell a product. If you're going to make new running shoes, a skateboard park, backpack, a new iPod, you have to know some science, don't you? You have to know some technology, don't you? You'll need to do some reading and writing, don't you? And you'll need to do some, some engineering, some art, design, and mathematics. If you look at all the disciplines involved in every one of them, we're using every single discipline, aren't we? If students spend time in what we used to call a major in science alone, those students are going to struggle when it comes time for them to find a career where you have to deploy all of these disciplines and do so simultaneously. That's the real world we live in today. And so we say that if you're learning science, you are learning STEM because you're investigating scientific phenomena, you're using tools and technology, you're applying engineering practices, and you're always applying mathematics. So if you're doing science correctly, you're teaching STEM. David Perkins at Harvard said, good thinking is a matter of making connections and knowing what kinds of connections to make. And these are not metaphorical connections. These are physical connections that take place inside the brain. Inside your brain you have 100 billion neurons, and those neurons make their connections. And when they make connections, those connections represent everything that we know. Many of you grew up in the 70s. Remember, this was the soundtrack for every scary movie. <laughs> but if you'll hold the silver, if you'll touch the silver bar with your index finger, please. Give me your other hand. 
we've now made an electrical connection. <laughs> and Phil, hold her hand, please. And Phil, touch the bar. Okay. This mimics exactly how the brain processes information to develop a competency that's represented as a memory. When students have an opportunity to mimic that same process, that's how they know they've learned. But they learn by doing, by making connections. Okay. The word cognition is always associated with learning and memory, but cognition actually means to know together. How is it that we take what we know, blend it together to represent what we know? But it's how we know it all together. And inside your brain, you have over 40,000 miles of blood vessels and capillaries and neural comparable distance of neural circuits. But the brain evolved with no academic disciplines in mind. Instead, the brain evolved with what are called association areas, and these are the areas of the brain responsible for making all of those connections that help us understand. And over the millennia, our brains evolved to be what we call doer brains. Our brains were designed to do. And well before there was anything called STEM or STEAM, our ancestors were involved in STEM and STEAM in order to survive and make a difference on the globe. And here's an example. Here are artifacts and procedures that our ancestors invented. But the question is, when did they invent them? Turn to your neighbor. You have 60 seconds to come up with as many dates as you can. When were these processes or objects invented? Individuals experience migraine headaches, other disorders, and what happens? What happened was holes were drilled into the skull. Okay. What's most interesting is that you can see how this has become very smooth around the hole. That's an indication that it's actually healed. That the individual first survived and second it healed. But most interestingly, this individual survived four surgeries <laughs> and did so over 17,000 years ago. Okay. We're the only animal on the entire planet that looks for problems and for problems to solve. And we find lots of ways to solve problems, but you have to visualize those problems in order to solve them. And that's why visualization and art become so important in that STEM slash STEAM model. 
But we say is that we were never born to read, instead we were born to invent, innovate, improvise, and improve. That's <clears throat> what produces new thinking. And even nature has been an inspiration for some of our products. As you look at these objects, nature inspired multiple inventions. Turn to your neighbor 30 seconds. What inventions do you think these objects sponsored as human inventions? Turn to your neighbor. don't exist yet, but their solutions do. The more solutions they have in their cognitive tool chest, that when they encounter a problem and say, I'll try strategy A, that doesn't work, I move on to plan B, that doesn't work, I move on to plan C, but you have to know what? That there are plans B, C, and D. Like this point, at Stanford used to say, the best way to get a good solution is to find lots of solutions and select the best one but you have to know lots of them in order to find that best one. Not all ideas were the best ideas. <laughs> Montgomery Ward's actually sold a gas iron. And I was gonna ask, did anyone ever buy one? If you bought one, you wouldn't be here. But one invention transformed the landscape of New York City in the late 1800s. And guess what that was? How about Otis Elevators? One invention. The Otis Elevator simply was a system by which it could catch a elevator car if it began to drop too precipitously, too fast. It was a safety mechanism. There were lots of elevators, and there were lots of elevator accidents, until Otis found a means by which every elevator could be locked, and no deaths would occur. Suddenly, New York City began to almost grow out of the ground. In early times, if you had a fourth floor apartment, that was the cheapest, because you had four flights of stairs, no matter what you had to do, you always had four flights of stairs to travel. The expensive rooms and apartments were always street level. With the invention of the elevator, all of that was reversed. <laughs> the high-rise apartments, the penthouse, those became the most expensive. Ground level, those were the cheapest. People wanted a view, and suddenly, the landscape of New York changed. But this all revolves around design, art and design. And this is why every notable university previously always had a school of art and sciences. Art is an essential part of science. 
When we think of STEM, we say art should be part of it, as we said, because art and design go together. But we ask, how can we get our STEM goals to be incorporated into every daily lesson? In California, in third grade, we teach structure functions and body parts. For young children, teaching them what body parts are found in all insects, what their functions are, then letting them create a new insect, play evolutionary biologist, and create your own new insect, and then have students write them a story about a day in the life of their new insect that they just created. Okay? And students created all kinds of insects, but you have to know the science in order to create the insect, don't you? This is why the number one genre in literature is, guess what? Science fiction. But you have to know the what? The science before you can write the fiction. And the fiction is always what? Just a slight departure. The adjacent possible. And that's what makes it a good science fiction story. Okay. In Orange County, we had children work on structure, function, and then build body parts to help with injuries. We did some work with Lehigh University where we actually built human hands, very crude versions of human hands, with 3D printers. And we gave those to kids who were either born without hands or kids who had lost a hand. And for these children, just to see how their faces lit up. If you buy a prosthetic, it typically will cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 to $5,200. We can produce an artificial hand for about $65. And we can provide them to kids who've never had a hand before. And for these kids, just to put two hands together to move objects about, that was worth every penny. Just to watch them light up. Okay. Understanding structure function will also help students solve these types of problems. And this is from the Tim's report. And this was the Tim's test. And many kids struggled with this only because they had no experience. And so we asked, well, what's the easiest way to get? Remember the story of the three little pigs? Okay. They're exasperated by little pig propagation by their neighbor, the big bad wolf. And so we need to find two safeguards to save the three little pigs. Engineering solutions. Most of you remember the story of three little pigs. Okay. Here are some solutions kids came up with. Building a house with an aluminum rooftop. That's a materials engineering solution. You change materials, you have a solution. Okay. You replace a chimney with a central heating system. <laughs> Wolves are afraid of snakes, so around the house build a book. A snake pit. Okay. Wolves are also afraid of the water. But you have to do some research on wolves to find this out, wouldn't you? Yeah. You can't just come up with solutions. You have to think, you have to read, and know that this is indeed an effective solution. Being afraid of water, so install a motion-sensitive water sprinkler system. He walks on the lawn, and what? Here comes the water. Okay. Or build a solar-powered, environmentally-friendly fan that blows air away from the house when he blows air <laughs> towards the house, neutralizing. Okay. Build a house with a 35-degree slope on the rooftop, so narrow that he can't go anywhere without gravity taking over. Okay. And wolves are afraid of water, so build a houseboat and position it 20 yards from the shore. <laughs> and kids actually came up with designs for houseboats. And they didn't mind doing the work, they didn't mind doing the reading, they didn't mind doing the math, they did all the research and came up with some great solutions. One kid had a bar in his <laughs> houseboat. <laughs> which told you something about what happens at home. <laughs> but nonetheless, it was a very comfortable solution. But for kids, just knowing that design 
is where all solutions begin. If you can draw, you now add the what? You add the math. And if you can do the math, you now take that one step further and you begin building your solution. And that's when it's fun for every kid, and every kid can do it. And the good part is that you don't have to be a good reader. And many kids who struggle in school, they do so because they're not competent readers. They're sometimes great thinkers, but they're not always good readers. We say no kid should be penalized for a past poor reading performance when we're now moving into engineering or we're moving into mathematics. Reading is a whole different field, isn't it? If we have a problem with reading, let that be in reading. But let a child learn in ways that all kids learn and learn very effectively. We want every kid to learn in this manner, design and engineering, that full STEM model. We did some work in Hawaii where we had kids take fish and we dissected the fish and they drew all the internal organs. You think they remember the organs? When kids look at the pictures and look, they probably forget those, don't they? When they dissect the fish, see the organs, draw the pictures, identify them, they learn them for a lifetime. That's how all of us learn best. And this is based on the notion, and this is from an article I wrote for the National School Boards Association, and this is on the fact that drawing does for the brain during the day, but dreaming does for the brain at night. Giving kids opportunities to draw, that's how we'll see kids do some of their very best thinking. They also can do some great thinking when you pose problems. And this is what I call Goodwill Engineering. I go to thrift shops and Goodwills and I find all kinds of nifty artifacts and I build them into engineering projects. Here's a hair dryer inside of a shoebox. And I pose the question, if, I, if I'm building a game and I want to find out which of these balls will float about 10 inches above the airflow, I say, well, which one is the ideal ball and why? And as you look at these, <laughs> As you look at this, you say, well, which one would be the ideal material and size? How many of you think this small styrofoam ball would be the best? Okay. How about a ping pong ball? No. How about a golf ball? No. How about the perforated white ball? What we ask students to do is to it's called claims, evidence, and reasoning. You make a claim, provide your evidence, and your reasoning that represents your thinking. With a measuring tape, we can see, here's the styrofoam ball. Here's a plastic ball. If we're looking for approximately 8 to 10 inches, here's the perforated ball. Here's a small styrofoam ball. And here's a ping pong ball. And that may be the ideal solution. But giving kids an opportunity to, to think and construct and then ask secondary questions about how do we produce the ideal outcome? What do we need to know? When kids can do these things, that's when we know they truly are able to solve the kinds of problems they're going to encounter in the future, but also to learn how to be creative. We're out of time, boys and girls. Don't worry, you'll remember all of this.
<laughs> this is my exercise with the. This is another one that we are working with now. Most kids are very familiar with light bulbs, but we now have the LED bulbs. And it's these LED bulbs that we can now use to make cards, little greeting cards. All they need to know is understand what we just saw, building a circuit. And now we build a circuit, and we can make some nice little greeting cards for kids who are homesick, colleagues who are homesick, parents, you name it. If you're studying the California Gold Rush, this was one that a child made for the California Gold Rush. Okay. But teaching kids how to make a simple circuit with a coin style battery, once folded, they can make almost any object and make a picture. We can teach them the writing behind the card. We can teach them, they, they can teach the art. They understand the circuitry. Okay. In California, we're also teaching about environments. Most of you probably saw the solar impulse. This was the first solar powered plane to travel around the Earth. Okay. We now know that 174 petawatts of energy actually reaches Earth's surface, which is 5,000 times more energy than we use every year. We could convert our planet into fully solar and satisfy all of our power needs. We need to find out how, don't we? We don't need the fossil fuels that are contaminating our environment. We have solar. And that can solve all of our problems. We now have what's called aquaponics, where we have water gardens. And we can, we can produce gardens without ground, gardens without soil. We've done work with schools where they didn't have room for a garden, and we made vertical gardens on a wall by just learning how to apply that concept of growing into another system. We found recycling and repurposing, taking old bottles and making them into water glasses. Okay. We can take old milk cartons and build them into lots of different items, including a sandwich box, mm -hmm. but also a coin holder, a bird feeder. I was just doing some work in Israel with all of the colleges of education. I spent one day on how the brain learns and half day on what happens to the developing brain when it's impacted by poverty, stress, and trauma. But we worked with schools, and these are some of the things that they did with old objects. They took old boots and made flower pots. They took old soccer balls, once again, made planters. But everything is recycled. Everything is repurposed, and we can do the same thing here. Okay. At the Houston Zoo, they took old water bottles, and they made beautiful art. And what we find is that banana peels will dissolve or disintegrate in two days. Some types of papers will take two to five months. Banana peels, six months. Cartons, cigarettes, about five years. Aluminum cans take 80 to 100 years before they break down. But plastics and plastic bottles, many of them, 1,000 years to never. And the problem is that many of them are winding up in the oceans. And they're contaminating our oceans permanently. Creativity. Here's a way, if you have to take pills, here's a new fork and spoon set. You can't forget to take your pills. Okay. Design. Redesigning stair steps to be drawers if you have a very confined living space. For those of you who have kids who grow too quickly, there's now a tennis shoe called an inchworm. And as your child's foot grows, you stretch that shoe out to fit the shoe. Isn't that a good invention? It just requires thinking. Thinking. Whenever there's a global disaster, the World Health Organization, one of the first things they send in are incubators because many kids fail to thrive without the incubators. But a group out of Boston, the Rhode Island School of Design, 
Because every place in the world we have the four C's, coffee, coke, cigarettes, and old car parts. <laughs> they took old car parts and built incubators. Most incubators cost between sixty-five to $80,000 each. They were able to take old car parts and build incubators that have already saved thousands of lives. What we want kids to do is to learn how is it that you can look at old car parts and see an incubator in there. Isn't that powerful thinking? We've done work with India where we've actually taken backpacks and built solar panels on backpacks where kids would leave their backpacks outside during school. At the end of the school day, pick up their backpacks, go home, and use their backpacks to power lights where they could do their homework. And these are kids who don't have lights at home, but now they do. We have solutions to every problem if we learn how to think. What we say is that STEM shouldn't just stand for science, technology, engineering, and math. It should stand for students and teachers enjoying every minute of the school day because it's finally connected. <laughs> and for many kids, they never enjoy school because they don't see the connections. That's why they come home in the afternoon and say, I didn't learn anything. We learn by making connections. And if it's not connected, we're not truly learning. Sir Ken Robinson says, you'll never be prepared, say, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you will never come up with anything original. We want kids to learn, it's okay to make mistakes in the process of thinking and creating. At the University of Indiana, they found that as much as we say IQ is important, emotional intelligence turns out to be twice as accurate in predicting lifetime success than IQ, but even more importantly, CQ, your creative quotient, is three times better in predicting lifetime success than IQ. As much as we focus on IQ, we should be focusing on what? The CQ, creativity. Creativity drives Silicon Valley. Creativity, because of Silicon Valley, drives our country and drives our national economy because of the minds here in Silicon Valley that are creative and productive. And that's what we want all kids to be. I recently was thinking about all the TV shows that need to be changed. We all watch Monday Night Football. We should instead have Monday Night Science. <laughs> instead of so you think you can dance, so you think you can teach. <laughs> Anyone who thinks teaching is easy has never taught. Okay. And how about dancing with the astronomers, <laughs> especially after the eclipse yesterday. Okay. And how about the teachers of Orange County? <laughs> Not the housewives, the teachers of Orange County. And most important, America's next inventor. And that's what we're truly after. And that's what STEM and STEAM will take us to. It's the inventors who drive our society. It's the inventors who drive our economy. It's the inventors who will save our planet. Okay. Ultimately, we want every child to feel like this, and that is that he comes home in the afternoon liking himself a little bit more than he did when he came in the morning because he's had a great day. We want every kid to come home in the afternoon and say, guess what I did today? It was the best day ever. And it will be the best day ever if you continue to support the STEAM efforts here in your school. And you're very fortunate that you have the leadership here that has gravitated towards and supported STEAM for your kids because you'll find that your kids will be some of the best thinkers, the best inventors, and the most successful kids that you've ever seen. Fortunately, you can do it right here at Central Park School. Okay. And with that, before Michael says, let my people go, I will. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you've learned something. You can support your kids. And we'll see you next
This is a friendly environment. <laughs> First, the, if you look at the practices for mathematics, English language arts, and science, I have a chart, and uh, I can send it to the principal here, and it shows all the practices for each of those disciplines, and then I have arrows showing that these are all the same disciplines, and I'll show you how you can teach them all simultaneously. Unfortunately, they're presented individually with no connections. The next generation science standards, at the very bottom of each new practice, identifies the English language arts or mathematics correlation. So you can now begin look to look and see how is it that this particular skill supports concepts from other disciplines. And for kids, that's when they say, aha, that's fun. That's neat. That's when they say learning is actually fun. What they get is a student of neurotransmitters that affect one region of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, and that's the region responsible for, guess what? Addictions. That's when they get addicted to learning because they're now making connections and the brain says, aha, I like that. That felt good. Yes, you had a question? I was, I was going to ask about the chart you had with reading math science mm -hmm. and how Yes. Is that something that we could... Can you get that? Yes, these slides are 50 cents each. <laughs> I'll send them to the school. And we could, if you have a website, you can put them on for the school. Uh, all the slides I've used tonight, uh, you can, as parents, review them. And there are also some ideas that you can actually use with your kids that you'll find very fun. Okay. Yes? Do you know if the junior high and high schools are about the same some are, some aren't. Okay. Well, I'm from higher education. We said where we say change occurs one funeral at a time. <laughs> so we see some degree of reluctance, but most most professionals within the discipline recognize how often they connect to other disciplines. There were disciplines before that were separate like biology and chemistry, and now we have biochemistry. And you see more and more disciplines coming together because that's how the real world is processed. It's not one discipline. Every discipline is connected to another. And I'll send you a chart showing how everything is truly connected. And what we're finding is that we are making some changes at the University of Arizona. What used to be Chemistry 101 is now called Chemical Thinking where the professor only can lecture between 12 to 15 minutes. The next 45 minutes are devoted to students making their own discoveries and talking about those important connections. Yes. Um, you've talked about EQ here, though we know CQ is the focus, but just curious, um, how does STEM or STREAM cover the EQ part of it? How does these two the EQ, the emotional intelligence, that's what EQ stands for. Emotional intelligence comes by way of having lots of opportunities to work with other individuals. And all the project-based learning comes by way of working in groups, where you begin to practice many of the kinds of skills that you see people practicing. When you work here in Silicon Valley, you work in teams, you work on projects, and you begin to develop those important skills. The old model used to be we'd have kids sit, sit in neat little rows and we'd say, Bill, don't talk to Sally. Sally, don't talk to Mary. Now we say, no, just the opposite. Have as many conversations as you can because that's one of the ways in which we begin to examine our own thinking and make those corrections. Okay. But that EQ is critically important. Okay. It's collaboration goes with creativity. Yes. Yeah. How can we help... Um kids improve in their critical thinking? Critical thinking? Yeah. By giving them problems to solve. And most kids don't learn critical thinking very much, do they? Kids hear lectures and they fill in blanks. They hear lectures and they answer very short questions. 
Critical thinking is when you have a problem to solve where you begin to recruit all of your competencies to solve that problem. And that means it may be more math in this problem, less science, more physics, but we use all of our resources. They come together to solve their problem. And that's the kind of critical thinking that we're looking for in the future, which is much different than the itty bitty short questions related to one discipline and one concept. The problem is with kids, there's a fellow, uh, Dr. J. Cecil, J. Cecil Parker at Berkeley said, an important distinction has to be made between knowing something and knowing what it's good for. And what's good for is that critical thinking that we now use to apply to solve a problem. Yes? Great presentation. Sorry? Great presentation. Thank you very much. Great group. This is like teaching the gifted class. <laughs> My question is, what happens if you have a child that has a strong aptitude in science but lacks the aptitude in the arts? How, in an ideal world, the child will complement both, you know, what you presented. How would you bring up that skill, the art part, to match up with the science? Two ways. One, you saw what we did with the design and engineering, solving the problem with the houseboats. Okay. That's drawing. Okay. The other is to have more art classes. Okay. What we found is that schools that said we need to spend most of our time helping develop competencies in mathematics and reading, and said we're going to cut out art and cut out social studies, we found that reading scores are actually flat or they take a dip. But by reintroducing art, we saw a nice little bump up in reading comprehension. Because reading comprehension allows kids to learn how to attach the picture to the word, which increases reading comprehension. Otherwise, kids learn to decode, and they can decode and read an entire page. And you ask them what they just read, and they may have read beautifully. And they say, I don't know. But it's the pictures behind the words, the representations for those words. That's what we're after. And here's an example of what happens. I have to check up it. TSA didn't take my cars apart. Here's a red car, a yellow car, and a blue car. And I can insert them into a tube. And now ask a child. In what order will the cars come out to the right? And in what order will the cars come out to the left? And then I turn the tube around and pose the same question. Now, what order will the cars come out to the right? And what order will the cars come out to the left? When a child can hold that information and manipulate it in the mind and solve that problem accurately, we know that he or she is ready for symbolic mathematics. If they cannot, they'll struggle with math. We want kids to learn how to create pictures in the mind's eye and learn how to manipulate them. And they can do so by first learning how to make your thinking visible by drawing. And then taking those images and applying those to what they're reading and writing. But it also begins with writing. Doug Reeves said that high achieving schools have been found to spend far more time with non-fiction writing than with fiction writing. Where kids are drawing and writing about things that are real. And that's what helps boost achievement. And that's why the STEM, STEAM models are so helpful. Yes? I have a question. I agree you know, for the next generation, um, connectedness, innovation, will be very important in But my question is, how does abstract thinking, like uh, philosophy, uh, morality, or history, fit into the five letters still? How does it fit? Oh. Well, actually, it fits into, we have another model called STREAM. <laughs> and the R is for reading language, arts, writing, discourse, dialogue, literature. Everything is in that R. And basically, what you have with the STREAM model is your full curriculum, where you can teach the abstract thinking. But the abstract thinking is critical because without the abstract thinking, you'll struggle with disciplines like mathematics and science and their applications in engineering. But the abstract thinking, the pictures in the mind's eye that are critically important. But morality, 
no matter what discipline you're teaching, ethics is minimal. And when we talk about science, we do talk about ethics. There is some ethical science, and there's some very unethical science. And there's some science that's actually financed by producers, which is very unethical. But it's something, again, we need to know about. Good question. Yes? So, um, we have fourth graders, and we're kind of wondering that since not all junior highs are based on the project based learning, how do we keep the momentum going as parents that have children enrolled in a place that's not project based? Two things. One, work with your school board work with your administrators to work with the feeder schools so that the next level continues the type of thinking that we know works for children. We're finding, I just got back from Washington, and we're, we're finding that more, more schools around the country are adopting these models because they work. The two countries that are considered the highest achieving nations, South Korea and Finland, have adopted this model. Finland now no longer teaches by discipline. And Finland is considered the highest achieving nation in the country, in the world. So we know countries that are doing the best are doing the best for a good reason because they're adopting the models that work best for children. 